Let us see now what the rotational inertia will be of a uniform disk with a mass m and a radius r rotating about an axis through its center of mass. As different parts of the disk are at a different distance from the axis, we will need to break the disk into parts, calculate their respective rotational inertia, and then sum it all up, or in other words, integrate over the entire disk surface area. The most straightforward approach is to consider infinitely small two-dimensional elements dm prime that are located at a distance r prime from the axis. Per definition, their rotational inertia will be equal to their mass times the square of the distance to the axis, or dm prime r prime squared. The rotational inertia of the disk, then, will be an integral of those rotational inertia over the entire disk surface area. That integral is a two-dimensional integral that is best solved in polar coordinates. While this approach is perfectly valid and preferred by the mathematically inclined, there is also another way to look at the problem. It is essentially identical, but is physically more intuitive and allows the process to be broken into two steps, each involving the solution of a one-dimensional integral. Let's go back to that original disk for a moment. Instead of breaking it into infinitely small elements, we can think of it as made of many thin rings starting with the largest ring with radius equal to that of the disk and ending with the smallest with the radius approaching zero. Let's look at one such ring that has radius r and the mass dm. We will still consider an infinitely small element dm prime, but this time not somewhere arbitrarily located along the disk, but along the rim of that ring. By definition, the rotational inertia of that green element dm prime will be dm prime r squared, where dm prime is its mass and r is the distance to the axis of rotation. Now we will integrate over the ring to calculate the rotational inertia of that ring. Given that all the ring elements are at an equal distance from the axis, the integral is very simple and gives us, as a result, the entire mass of the red ring, dm, multiplied by the square of its radius. Once we know the rotational inertia of that ring, we can integrate over all the rings to obtain the rotational inertia of the entire disk. It is clear, however, that rings with larger radius will have larger mass, and so we will need to find exact relationship between the mass and the radius of a ring before we can proceed with the solution of the integral, dm r squared. Let's look at the concept of surface mass density, defined as the mass per unit area. Our disk is a uniform object, and so sigma must be the same anywhere on the disk and does not depend on the location or the size of any considered disk element. That also means that that surface mass density sigma will have the same value if we take the entire mass of the disk m and divide it by its total area pi r squared. So the uniformity of the disk gives us a direct relationship between the mass of the ring and the area of that ring. dm must be equal to the mass of the disk over the area of the disk times dA. We see that the mass of a thin ring here is directly proportional to the rim surface of that ring. So the question now is, what is the area of the rim of that ring? Let's have a close look at that ring again. In terms of its area, we can think of it as the difference between the area of a disk with a radius r plus dr, or pi r plus dr squared, and the area of a disk with a radius r, or minus pi r squared. The area of the ring then becomes pi r squared plus 2 pi r dr plus dr squared minus pi r squared. Here I have opened the parenthesis. Not only we have the pi r squared terms cancelled, but in the limit of an infinitely small change in the radius dr, we can also neglect the dr squared term. That gives us that the area of the ring must be equal to 2 pi r dr. And so we can go back to the mass of the ring, dm, that must be equal to the mass of the disk over the area of the disk, which is sigma, or the surface mass density, multiplied by the area of the ring, in this case 2 pi r dr. 
After we cancel out pi, we get the following for the mass of a ring with a radius r. dm must be equal to 2 times the mass of the disk over the radius of the disk squared times r dr, where here little r is the radius of that ring. And now we're ready to look at the integral for the rotational inertia of the disk again. Integral of dm r squared. Remember, dm here was the mass of the ring and r was its radius. And we're integrating over all the rings that make up the disk. We already found out the mass of the ring as a function of its radius, so we're going to replace that in the integral. And we get for the rotational inertia of the disk. 2 times the mass of the disk over the radius of the disk squared integral of r cubed dr with limits here from 0 which is the radius of the smallest ring and big r the radius of the largest ring and the disk itself. Solving the integral then gives us 2 times m over the radius of the disk squared times r to the fourth over 4 with limits from 0 to r or 2 times the mass of the disk over the radius of the disk squared times the radius of the disk to the fourth divided by 4. We can cancel r squared and a factor of 2 and we get the final result to be 1 half of the mass of the disk times the radius of the disk squared, which is the rotational inertia of a uniform disk about an axis through its center of mass.